Blog Talk Radio. Out 
there, and Adrian Ramirez, uh, his strength coach, and you know Stephen is a striking coach. He's got a great team, guys that are dedicated to him. They're full time coaches with Team Takedown, which is a little bit different structure than some of the other athletes uh, I deal with, where these guys are dedicated 40 hours plus per week to Johnny and to the other athletes on the team, and that really helps. I think it shows in the evolution of Johnny's um, uh, his career. If you look back, I mean, he hasn't had that many fights in total. He's one of the, the less experienced guys, I think, at the elite uh, part of the division, you know, uh, in elite sports. He's come so far, I think, because his work ethic is – I don't. I don't think I've seen a better work ethic and dedication. Um, and then he has the coaches constantly, you know, molding him and pulling those skills out of him. Um, you know, with that said, it, getting him on weight is always difficult, but we always do it properly. We do it the right way. And then letting him get in the cage with all the skills that the coaches put into him. I mean, that, that's just fun to sit back and watch. Awesome. Now, something I've always wondered with you, Mike, is um, you're known for getting these guys on weight. And and that's like the the moniker. If, if somebody has a problem with the weight cut, they they want Mike Dolce. They want to enlist you. But is there any other um, items you address when you're coaching these guys, such as you know like the mental aspect or or even sort of game planning? Is there do you stretch yourself out over other areas of the fight with the, with your athletes? I do, and because of the the Dolce diet um, brand. You know, it's, it's, it's our registered trademark brand. It's, it's our book series and the black and gold T-shirt I, I wear. People think it's all diet. It's all about nutrition. That's it is part of what I do, but I think it's a small part of what I do. I'm, I'm really a I'm a longevity advocate before anything else. I'm, I'm a, a coach, a performance coach, a lifestyle coach. Um, I help the athletes and any individual. I help them get their mind right. I say we get all their houses in order, their, their mental, their physical, their emotional houses in order, which really becomes very necessary as you get closer to a, a world-class performance scenario. I mean, guys like Johnny and, and Vitor Belfort, Chael Sonnen, they're competing at the elite level. They're competing at the Olympic level, and they're vying for that first place. I say the difference between first and last place in, in a 40-meter sprint or 100-meter sprint is literally a blink of an eye. There's no room for error. So what I try and do is I try and get in there with these guys and their teams and their families, and we try and cultivate the most efficient lifestyle for the athlete to fulfill their, their potential. That's what I, I try and do. I think what I do best is I remove all the all the blockages and all the obstacles, many of which are mental, many of which are external, environmental, and then you know lifestyle was one I'm, I'm most famous for, which would be the diet, but also the, the training program, the periodization, the peaking. I mean, I'm a specialist when it comes to that stuff. So I think why my guys are able to make weight so well and be so healthy is not because of what we do during fight week. It's what we do for the previous three-week cycles before that. You know, I, I schedule everything in three-week cycles, and I start focusing on an athlete 12-week cycles prior to competition. We get the periodization program, the peaking program all set up. And that's what I try and do with these guys. So, it, you know, man, I, I say, you know, I kind of you know joke sometimes. If the at, athlete needs me scalping tickets in the parking lot the night of their fight while everyone's inside watching them compete, well, that's what I'm doing. Whatever the athlete needs, I'm going to be. I'm the guy that's going to get it done for them, and uh, that allows the athlete to compete at their best and be healthy and kind of, you know, move on in their life. Excellent. Let me let me ask you this, Mike. Is there one particular athlete that stands out that's been really hard to get his, to get his weight down? Is there like one more so than any others that's been really challenging for you to to get their weight proper? Um, you know. Johnny is a challenge uh, because he's so big. You know, I mean, he's a 210-pound guy normally. He said he was able to maintain a body weight of just under 205 for this training camp. Well, that's still 35 pounds. You know, Johnny uh, weighed in at 196 on Tuesday when we checked into Montreal. And he, everyone was like, wow, you look amazing. And he does. I mean, he's just massive and muscular. He's in great shape. That's a big dude, man. And Johnny's my height. He's 5'9", 5'10". So he's not an exceptionally tall welterweight. He's actually in the height range to be a lightweight. 
just got so much damn muscle on his frame. So Johnny is a challenge. Uh, Tiago Alves was a challenge initially um, when I first you know took him over, and now it's actually very easy to be with Tiago. In time, same thing with Vitor Belfort. When I first took over Vitor, it was very difficult for him to make middleweight 185. And then in time, you know, we, we fast forward to what we did in Brazil. Vitor only cut four pounds. Um, the, the weigh-in day, you know, in Brazil, and everybody was, you know, commenting on just how amazing his physique looked. Well, it's because he had been living properly for two years, and you know, they, they make statements, you know, very, you know, uneducated statements um, about, you know, how he was able to look like that and just drastic difference. You know, it, it was two years of work that culminated in, in that body and that performance. It wasn't. You mean nothing. It's nothing store bought. It's nothing that you can just go out and pick up. You have to work hard. You have to live the right lifestyle. So I think with these guys, you know, what I'm trying to do is I try and get them to focus on the long term. And when I sit down with them initially, it's like, listen, my goal is for you to live as long as you can, for you to extend your life and your vitality, your your, your you know usefulness while you're here. By doing that, by making those lifestyle choices, the short term stuff takes care of itself. If you're focusing on being 120 years old and being active during, you know, all those 12 decades, well, immediately you don't have to worry because you're not running around killing your body, abusing it, polluting it. The short-term stuff kind of makes it easier. So most of the athletes are, are pretty difficult. Now, a guy like Nick Lentz, who, you know, kind of famously we dropped him from 155 where he was rather successful to 145, and now he's, you know, knocking on the door that he's ranked, you know, top eight as a featherweight, um, you know, knocking on the door top five. Nick Lentz is the ideal athlete. He does everything a coach requests of him. And he's such a, I mean, he's a physical specimen. He, he's so gifted. So a lot of the guys are difficult initially, but Nick Lentz is one of the guys that he was, he was turnkey. We just worked with him, and he I mean, immediately, his body responded. And what's funny about Nick, Nick actually is heavier in the off season on this lifestyle program than he was when he was competing at 155. So when he was competing at 55, he was walking around at like 60, 168. Now as a featherweight, he's walking around at 173, but competing 10 pounds lighter, and says that these weight cuts are easier than when he was cutting at 155. That that stuff really makes me proud, because that shows we're doing the right thing. This kid is finally healthy. Amazing. What What's the single most important thing somebody can do? Maybe not a fighter, but anybody listening to our show to um, live a healthier lifestyle as far as how it, how it pertains to your philosophy. Well, I, I have the, the, the Dolce diet principles, and it's pretty much a 1 through 50 list depending on how specific we're going to get. But we start with the first principle. If you can do nothing else, just principle number one is eat only earth-grown nutrients. That's real food. So now we're getting away from everything that's processed, no pills, no powders, no potions, earth-grown nutrients. No matter where you are on the planet, you can look at your plate, look at the menu, and say, what's earth-grown, what's real? Well, I can eat that, and I'm going to be pretty damn healthy. Step two, or rule number two, is eat every two to four hours based upon what you just did and what you're about to do. So now we're eating only the highest quality nutrients, Step two, we're eating them often enough to keep our blood sugar stable, to keep our metabolism moving, to keep our energy levels up, but not to, because we're eating what we just did, what we're about to do, we're not overindulging. If we have something coming up, we're not going to overindulge and be slow and sluggish. And number three, we have to be accountable. We eat until we're satisfied, not until we're full. We're not eating until we're pushing ourselves away from the table. We're eating until we're satiated, we feel good, and we're stopping just before we get to that full point. So there's no bottleneck in your digestive system. It's very important. A lot of people don't realize that. Think about driving down the highway, and if you have to keep stopping at, at these bottlenecks and intersections, it takes so long to get where you're going. Now, if the streets are wide open, you can drive even slower and get to where you're going much faster, much more efficiently. I mean, these are some of the general uh, universal principles. And I, it, it's really it's that easy. And people say, because I have all this success with these elite athletes, that there must be something crazy scientific. The craziest thing I can say is it's common sense. You know, I, I kind of I think Felice Herrick uh, had said, you know, rather famously, that Mike Dolce made eating real food cool again. And that is something that I agree with. I think that's freaking awesome. 
It, it's real food. It, it, it's none of this, this. There's no magic bullet. The magic bullet is patience and consistency and accountability. You know, common sense. That, that that's the magic bullet. Amazing, uh, Mike. Uh, I was going to ask you something. Uh, go in the opposite direction. Um, you're all. You also have been working with Chael Sonnen for a while. He's not actually going down the way. He's actually going the opposite direction. Um, what's the difference when you're trying to get a guy to bulk up safely so that he still, you know, retains his endurance, his speed, um, you know, so that the other games, the other parts of his game don't change? Yeah, and that's something we work on with performance factors. Now, a guy like Chael, he's a little bit different. When Chael was fighting at middleweight, he was 230 plus pounds in the off season. That's a massive middleweight. That's a good-sized light heavyweight, and a lot of the heavyweights are walking around somewhere. And it's guys like Pat Barry, guys like Kane, they're walking around 230, 240. Well, that's where Chael's walking around now. Chael was up at you know 238, 240 pounds when we were filming The Ultimate Fighter. And I made this statement on Joey Diaz's uh, podcast, the Church of, what's, Church of What's Happening Now, and people started to just, you know, flame me on the Internet and, you know, oh, Dolce, he's a liar. He makes up all this, you know, bullshit trying to, like, hype his diet. I said it kind of innocently in conversation because I saw Chael on the scale that day, 238 pounds after a training session. I mean, I'm not trying to hype anything. It, he's just a freaking big, strong dude, you know, with the proper frame to hold that. So what we did with Chael, we changed some of his training, more explosive work, more posterior chain, more the, the, the power muscles, posterior chain, it's the hamstrings, it's the glutes, it's the lower back, it's the upper back, the power, the explosive muscles. We focused more on those areas, and then we work in his performance factors. We make sure he keeps his agility and his flexibility. So as he gained a little bit more size and mass, we made sure his flexibility remained intact as when he was a middleweight. That was very important. A lot of athletes, they go through these bulking phases, but they forget about their flexibility or their reactive ability, which is very important. For me, reactive ability in fighting in MMA is the most important characteristic. I mean, a split second off in timing and you're knocked out. A split second on in timing and you're winning by knockout. So with Chael, that was very important. Um, you know, and he when he fought you know previously, people say, oh, he you know, never won a fight in UFC at 205. Well, when Chael was fighting at 205, he was walking around at 202. He was just fighting at 205 because there was an opening in that division for him to get into the UFC, and that's why he was there. But he truly, he probably could have made 170 back in those days. He, you know, he was walking around lighter than Johnny Hendricks and Tiago Alves at that point. Um, now he's walking around a, a true, legitimate light heavyweight. I mean, he could fight heavyweight if he wanted to. So let me ask you this: um, Is do you think Chael is is a better fighter, or will be a better fighter at 205 pounds than he was at 185 pounds? Is he better suited as a light heavyweight? At this point in his career, yes, I, I do believe so. Um, Chael's in his mid 30s now, and making those weight cuts. I mean, he outgrew the, the middleweight class um, probably two years ago. So, you know, the work that he and I have been doing, you know, going back to, you know, the Brian, after he had that layoff, um, you know, after he fought Anderson and almost beat Anderson and then he had, a, you know, a, a long layoff, when he came back, his body changed. I mean, the time away from cutting weight allowed his body to catch up and, you know, maintain a normal, natural, healthy body weight, which was near 230 pounds. So for him to fight at 185, you know, he did the Brian Stan fight, he did the Bisping fight, then he went and did the Anderson fight. I mean, that was a lot of work. I mean, we're talking about 45-pound weight reductions um, in order to get him, you know, to perform, and that's against the most elite athletes on the planet. Um, you know, so that was a lot of work. So him at, at 205 now, I think, is a great fit where the weight cut is much more appropriate, uh, where, you know, 205 to, you know, he was up at the, the, the high 230s. Now most of his training camps, he's been in the high 220s. Now we're talking about a 20-pound weight reduction instead of a 40-pound weight reduction. Can we expect to see um, like, does, is his mixed martial arts game going to be a lot different, or are, are we just going to see uh, the, the same Chael Sonnen, but uh, a bigger, stronger, faster version of him? Bigger, stronger, faster, and with tricks. You know, Jail, Chael's been training with Vinny Magalhaes uh, quite a bit now. Um, that was over the last year or so. Vinny was one of the co-coaches on the Ultimate Fighter 17 with us. 
um, Vinny was working with Chael previously, you know, before uh, the Ultimate Fighter, and they've continued. They're actually training together right now. So I think having Vinny to train with on a, a daily basis, a weekly basis now, has really helped Chael transfer his elite wrestling to an elite submission wrestling game, which is something that really, you know, shouldn't be overlooked, you know, in, in the world of, of MMA, because wrestling and jiu-jitsu, they're, they're so closely related with a few fine points. You know, once you kind of blend those finer points together, it just becomes one art in itself. I think Chael has blended that really well. Then he's got, uh, got striking coaches like Jamie Huey and Clayton Hires um, who are out there keeping it, his striking good. And I, I think Chael striking is is good um, for the division. He's, he's a better striker than some of the guys that are out there, but he's not the best striker in the division. We know that. He's the best fighter in the division, and that's what we want, and that's what we need. I think he has enough strong points to beat every single person, especially and including John Jones at, at 205. So I, I do think uh, you know, we are going to see a bigger, bigger, faster, stronger, better conditioned, better, more resilient, um, and then he, he, he definitely has a few more tricks uh, in his toolbox. When you when you look at him now and you've seen him at middleweight and uh, you see him going into this fight with John Jones, a, a lot of people, most people, are not giving Chael much of a chance in the fight. He's you know, saying he was he was gifted this shot, he doesn't deserve it, and he is going to get beat soundly in the process, and we're just going to move on with the next light heavyweight contender. Uh, what would you tell those people that that really aren't giving Chael a, a, a shot in this fight? Uh, I'll take those bets. You know, I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, two to one or three to one odds. Uh, I'll, I'll take those bets all day. Uh, you know, you never, never count Chael Sonnen out. I, I think Chael, you know, from what I've seen, from what I know, I mean, he, he's the favorite. You know, if, if you guys, if the world, if the book. Uh, bookmakers were able to see what's going on in training camp, how he's looking, how he's performing. I think those odds would change really quick. But what they're doing, what most people do, is they look at his last um, year or so, his last fight, and they they write him off as a result of that. Um, they look at you know maybe some headlines and they write him off as a result of that. But if you break down the fights, you say, all right, so Chael is 10 years older than John Jones. Chael is a much more accredited wrestler than John Jones, and that was John's strength. He would use his wrestling to allow his striking uh, to come through. Well, John can't use his wrestling effectively against Chael. John's going to be really on the defensive when it comes to wrestling. And how is John going to be with his striking when he's constantly worried about Chael getting close, getting on his hips, getting his hands locked you know, uh, on him? That's an issue. Um, Chael's 10 years older, and he's, he's, it's the big brother mentality. You know, Chael's been beating up guys like John Jones his whole life, his whole career, and that's the mentality we have going into it. He's going to beat the piss out of John Jones for 25 minutes no matter what. He's ready to go through the wars. I mean, don't forget. Look at look at what Chael did to Nate Marquardt. Look at what Chael did to Yushin Okami. I mean, look at some of Chael's better performances. That's the Chael son, and that's stepping into the the fight on April 27th there in New Jersey. I mean, it's going to be a nasty machine, and that's we're training Chael for 25 minutes of nonstop aggression, no matter what gets broken, no matter what gets ripped open, no matter what part of his body gets torn off, no matter how much blood is there, no matter how many bones crack, we are pushing him and training him to power through that. And I don't think John is prepared to power through that. John almost tapped when Vitor was playing with his arm. John, We saw John mentally start to break when Lyoto Mashida put a little bit of heat on him and touched his jaw a couple times. John's never really had that big brother on top of him beating the piss out of him. I mean, Chael's going to walk across the cage and give John Jones a big old wedgie and freaking give him a, a you know a, a noogie, and John's not going to be able to do anything about it. That That's the type of fight we're looking for. Amazing. What about – you made hate lines. All your name was brought up several times, Mike, when um, the UFC was trying to put together this cyborg Rusey fight. And I, and I know that we, we've heard your take on that. We've heard Dana's and Cyborg's and Tito's take on that. But just to kind of to touch back on that topic, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, do you think Cyborg can actually make it down to 135, like in your expert opinion? Can we, can we touch on that? You know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll share with you guys uh, what really no one's asked me um, the questions. Cyborg's camp, they reached out to me before any of this, any of this stuff. They reached out to me last fall. Would I be willing to work with Cyborg? Do I think I could get her down to 135? So let me meet her. I sat down. I met with her. 
I looked at her. We talked about her lifestyle, her training, her diet, her supplement program. I said, absolutely. What she was weighing, I think she was weighing 168 the day we sat down, and she hadn't been training. She was on vacation. She was handling business. She wasn't eating very well. She was 168 pounds. I said, well, listen, Chris, if I just get you on my diet, that 168 is going to pretty quick turn into 158. We start training pretty hard. That 158 is going to get down into the low 150s. We're going to touch the high 140s. Before we start the three-week weight cut, three, you know, three weeks before fight, based on my experience working with elite athletes, and that's all I've done over the last decade is I've worked with elite mixed martial artists, regardless of gender. I work with men and women. I did not see a problem. And she was great. We were on the same page. And then time goes by, and there's conversations back and forth. There's conversations in the media and, you know, my name gets brought into the headlines. I, I didn't mention this stuff publicly. And then my name gets brought into the headlines. And, you know, Dana mentioned me. It's very flattering, and I appreciate it. And then Tito kind of, you know, mentioned my name. And I don't know if it wasn't, you know, necessarily good, but he was kind of incredulous as if it was even possible. Then they start saying, oh, my, the doctor said it's absolutely impossible. Well, I tell you what, any doctor is going to say that it's 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 not healthy to do it. I'm the first person to say cutting weight's not healthy. I'm the first guy to say it's not healthy. I've cut weight. I've cut 20, 30, 40 pounds in very short periods of time. Cutting, I wish all athletes would compete at what I call their three-week weight. Three weeks before the fight, that's usually when they're in their best ever shape. I wish athletes would compete at that, but they choose not to. So what do we do? We have to find the best, the most healthy ways to get them where they're going. We offer suggestions. Ultimately, it's up to the athlete. So as time goes by, nobody from Cyborg's camp ever called me again. They never contacted me. They never brought me in for a follow-up. They never said, hey, Dolce, you know, we're really curious here. Everyone else is saying it. it's, it's not possible. Why do you say it's possible? And then I could have sat down and strategically said, well, here's what I would do. Here's what I see. Here's the, trouble. Here's the, the flaws in what she's currently doing. And here's what I've done with when Chael Sonnen was 260 and I got him down to 205. Or not Chelsea, when Rampage Jackson, I'm sorry, before he fought Machida, he was 260 pounds entering that training camp. I got him down to 205, and we beat Lyoto Machida, who's a very tough former world champion. And that's a terrible matchup for Rampage, a southpaw who kicks and knees the body. That's the worst matchup ever for Rampage. 60 pounds, I mean 55 pounds overweight, got him down, no problem, and he won a really tough fight based upon strength and conditioning. Weight cut was not an issue. You look at Chael making his 40-plus pound weight cuts, you know, when he went out there and beat up Brian Stan and when he fought Bisbing. I mean, that's the Bisbing fight was a war. People say it was, oh, it wasn't the most exciting fight. It's because these guys were fucking so evenly matched. It, w- it was certainly a battle. Johnny Hendricks and Thiago Alves, both guys 40 pounds over. I mean, Dwayne Ludwig, I mean, we got him down over 40 pounds in less than a week to take a short-notice fight versus Jim Miller um, after Christmas. I mean, I have the experience. I've been there. I've been in the locker rooms, let's say. You know, I've been, you know, in the trenches. I have some ex- experience. And I was, I was shocked that nobody from Cyborg's camp called me. And I reached out to Chris. And I said, hey, what's going on? And she said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting to hear from my management, waiting to hear from my management. Well, nobody ever called me. The UFC did call. They confirmed if I would be willing to help because it was – I don't believe the UFC was pushing for it. It was part of – the contract stipulation on Cyborg's side, they requested a specific amount of you know, money to pay for somebody like me, whether it was me or somebody else. They looked for an allocation of funds to allow her to make the weight drop. So the UFC wasn't trying to bring me in and forcing me on Cyborg. Cyborg's team asked for me. And then all of a sudden, nobody calls me again, and then they say it's just not possible. Interesting. It's, it's interesting, and it's, it's kind of unf- – I would at least like to have the conversation, or I would like to have nobody known that I was even involved because, it, you know, I don't want to be involved. I have more than enough athletes. I mean, I'm, I'm freaking busy. I'm here with Johnny Hendricks right now. I got Chael the following month. I got Vitor Belfort the following month. I mean, I'm, I'm busy with world-class pay-per-view main event guys. I don't need headlines from – Chris Cyborg, as much as I would like to work with her, I think she's a great athlete. I think it would be certainly spectacular at 135. I do think she would be the world champion at 135. I just don't want to be involved in that kind of drama gossip type situation, which 
you know, it, so it, uh, it was disturbing. And this is kind of the first time I'm actually speaking openly about it. I don't know what happened there. It was kind of a weird situation. Interesting. Okay, now, Tito Ortiz, he comes out on Inside MMA, HD Next program, or Access TV now, rather, and um, and it seems to be the, the, the recording pattern with him that she wants to have children in her future and that a drastic weight cut would inhibit her from doing so or at least put her at risk to not be able to have children. So what is, is that just an excuse in your opinion or is, is there some real validity, validity to that? I do not see any scientific basis for such a statement. If the athlete, if the individual was following a healthy lifestyle protocol in the months prior to the weight cut, and that's what I said to Chris. We spoke in November talking about a February fight. And I said, Chris, you're 168 right now. We could have you on weight no problem for that fight in February. Let's do it. Okay, let's wait for my management. Let's, and a week would go by, then a month went by, then it's the Christmas season. I'm like, wow, we just missed six weeks of proper lifestyle, of healthy living, of periodized training program, of an intelligent process. We're six weeks, and then all of a sudden it's it's the new year. Now we're in the January. Well, now it's fight camp time. It's still possible, but now we're cramming. And then, you know, the, the negotiations went, and then, boom, she was off the table, and all this stuff was coming out. Now, mixed martial arts, MMA, any contact sport, any combat sport, any weight class restricted sport, there are inherent issues, safety issues, that the athlete chooses to undertake. With that being said, if the athlete is following the proper lifestyle in the months prior to the the weight cut, it shouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't be an issue. And if it was an issue at any point, that's when we step in and pull the plug and we say, hey, the girl can't make weight. Sorry, guys. Like, she's going to miss weight. And athletes do miss weight sometimes. If she can't make 135, she comes in at 138. Well, that's the deal. And then the, the, the main event's off, but she preserves her health. Health is the most important thing. MMA and sport, it's just entertainment. I mean, it's awesome. It, it makes money for a lot of people. It's just, at the end of the day, it's just a fist fight. It's just entertainment. Nothing ever should jeopardize the health of the athlete. But if the health of the athlete is most important, I wonder why she wasn't following a healthy lifestyle months prior to competition. That's the question I, I would kick back to her management system and her, her health team, her medical team. Well, why wasn't she doing all the healthy things in the months and even years prior if now health is such a concern? And I'm a health advocate. I'm a longevity advocate. Ask any one of my athletes. The first thing they say is, I feel healthy. For the first time, I feel healthy. Like Nick Lentz, this is the best I ever felt fighting 10 pounds lighter than I've ever fought. I'm a health guy, and that's what kind of gets lost in all this, all these conversations and all these headlines. It's just media fodder and these public you know, press releases and, and you know, these big talking points. I don't care about that shit. What did she eat today? How many hours did she sleep? How hard is she training? That, those are the questions that I care about. I don't care about any of the, the bullshit, any of the, the, the management, the media, the promotion. I don't care about that stuff. Chris... What, what time did you wake up this morning? What time did you go to bed last night? What did you eat? How hard did you train? How do you feel? Everything good at home? You're happy? You're in a good mood? Your family's all right? Mom's all right? Dad's all right? That's the stuff that freaking matters. But nobody was talking about that in her camp, it seems. They're all talking about money. And, and money and opportunity. Money and opportunity. What about the freaking health of this girl? And everyone's talking about her health, but it seems that nobody really cared about her health except for me. Hmm. Wow. How enlightening. Mike... I tell you what, man, I think we could have you on for our whole two hours. Of, you know, um, you have a lot to say, and, uh, and it's it's really interesting stuff to, to hear sure. from you. After we get done uh, here in Montreal, man, let's set it up. I, it's fun talking to you, fun talking to your audience. Um, and you guys ask good questions, and these are things I like to talk about, kind of some of the, the more mundane, you know, stuff that, that gets a little old, but these are good conversations. And, you know, this is something I'm just – because my name's, you know, with, with the Chris thing, I, I, really, I kind of thought about, you know, even talking about it, but I mean, you guys asked the question, and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to tell it. My name has been mentioned in the media so many times by other entities and not me. It's time I actually did say something. Like, right. Here's the deal. Here's what happened. Excellent. Well, thank you for opening up to us, man. I really appreciate that. And we'll definitely pass the word on 
and, and get your voice heard through BJPen.com without a doubt. Um, real quick before we let you go, because um, we got K, we have Mr. K J Noons up next. Um, what is your prediction for the main event this weekend, UFC 158? I think George St. Pierre is going to win. Now, how is he going to win? I'm not sure. You know, if you look at the, the data, you would say GSP is going to win a decision. He's going to control the fight. If I was his coach, I would probably, you know, say that would be the A game plan. We would look for a few um, positions to stop the fight in. But I think that's just George's style, and you can't argue with a multimillionaire that has that type of style. Um, Nick, you can certainly, I mean, never count Nick out. I, I'm a, a huge Nick Diaz fan. Uh, actually, I'm a big fan of the Diaz brothers. I'm a big fan of, of Team Caesar Gracie. I like what those guys bring to the sport, but George St. Pierre, he's just been so um, untouchable for you know so many years. I honestly think the only guy in the welterweight division right now that is able to beat GSP is Johnny Hendricks for two reasons. Johnny's a better wrestler, and Johnny's a bigger hitter. If George can't take Johnny down, George has to stand with Johnny, and then what happens? Then he has to exchange with Johnny. Johnny will hit George, and George will get hurt. I mean... Right. That's that's just the way, and I, you know, Johnny's my guy, and I, I'm biased. I know I'm biased. I know, you know, I, I love my kids, right? I know that that's what I'm saying. But if you look at the stats, Johnny's a two-time D1 national champion, and he's regarded as one of the greatest wrestlers ever to come out from, you know, the, the legendary John Smith over there at Oklahoma. So that being said, what George is going to bring to the table wrestling-wise is not going to phase Johnny. He's seen it before. He's been in those positions tens of thousands of times. What does George do when he can't take Johnny? Now, George can take Nick down, and Nick poses some problems, submission problems on the ground. George trains with guys like John Donaher and Henzo Gracie and some other elite submission specialists. I think they're going to be prepared for that stuff. I don't know that Nick's ground game is any better than Carlos Condit's, who's very aggressive on the ground. Carlos came close, but he never pulled it off. That being said, GSP beats Nick. Johnny, hopefully, you know, gets past Condit. And then we have a new champion at some point this year. Excellent. All right. Well, best of luck, luck to you to you and your team out there, Mike. And definitely I'll be in touch after the fight. Let's try to get you on the show again as soon as possible. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it, and I, I look forward to it. And once again, I say it all the time, BJ Penn, the GOAT, greatest <laughs> fighter of all time. BJ Penn is a legend. And I think he needs to hear that, and the people, we all need to be saying that. BJ's a legend in the sport, certainly inspired me and inspired so many of the, the elite athletes I work with. They all have posters of BJ on their walls. So well, let, let's keep people talking about that, too. Right on. All right, Mike, thanks again. We'll talk to all you right, soon. All right, guys, thank you. Uh-huh. Bye. Mr. George. Always good to talk to Mike Dolce. That was, a, that was some great insight from him with all those topics. I was wondering a lot of things. Especially the cyborg stuff was really interesting. You know, I mean, Tito had outright said, body fat is too low. There's no way she can make it. And then here's the expert in that area saying that is not true. She absolutely can make it. And it really makes no sense that she hasn't been working yeah. to uh, change, that, change her lifestyle. So, 